now, live from Prof Rugby Club in Limerick, this is the Off The Ball Roadshow in association with Heineken Rugby Club. Featuring Eddie O'Sullivan, George Clancy, Jer and Peter Malone, and in a week that saw some other royal wedding that nobody cares about, we've got Irish rugby's own royal couple, John Hayes and Fiona Steed. But first, would you please welcome on stage your glamorous host for the night, Mr. Joe Malloy. Hello, 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 hello. Hello, Brof, how are we doing? Hello. Thanks very much for coming out. We're delighted to be here. We do um, increasingly these shows for Off The Ball at different rugby clubs around the country. We've been to New Ross, we've been to Buccaneers. We thought we have to come to Brof. I mean, surely, if we don't come to Brof, what are we doing? Uh, we've got a brilliant night in store. We're here with uh, HeinekenRugbyClub.com and to get member-only events such as tickets, events, invites for nights like these and discount codes and much more, you can join HeinekenRugbyClub.com now. Uh, we're packed in, so we've got a great crowd here. We've already had Eddie do a masterclass session with some of the coaches and youngsters. Thumbs up, Eddie. Thumbs down. Thumbs up from Eddie. He's okay. He's happy with what you're doing out there. Uh, we're going to kick things off with the two guests of honour. So we really do, I mean, it is uh, rugby royalty, I guess, as JP said. Uh, in Fiona Steed, we have 62 appearances for Ireland, which was a record when she made those 62 appearances. She played in three World Cups. And then in John Hayes, he came here when he was 18, 19, had never played rugby at all, and did okay for himself, I guess. So 200-plus uh, appearances for Munster, 217, I think, to be exact. The first man to get past 100, and, uh, 100 appearances for Ireland, 105 in the end. Uh, two Heineken Cups with Munster and uh, played on the lines as well. So not bad. We figured we had to come here because the only way he would ever do an interview with us is if we literally came down to Brough and said, we're here, come in. So let's do that now. Will you give them a warm round of applause? I know they're a big part of the club here. Fiona Steve, John Hayes, everyone. <laughs> How are we doing? Fiona, you're very welcome. Thank you. John, you're very welcome. Nice job, well. Thanks for coming. We bullied you into doing this. This yeah. is your worst nightmare. Shamed into it. <laughs> <laughs> there was a touching uh, moment there of romance where we have some food outside at the back and um, I, said, John, <laughs> I said to John before, we have some pizza and chips out there and he goes, she said, a little bit of pizza. So out uh, we went and got some pizza. And a while later, Fiona came out to see John horsing into pizza, saying, we literally said in the car, we were both hungry, and you didn't even tell me about the food. <laughs> that kind of sums up the relationship a little bit so far. I just, yeah. know, I just know her so well, I know she wouldn't eat the pizza, so there was no point telling her. And to be fair, I don't like cold chips. OK, well, our apologies. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're both very welcome. So um, I won't turn this into a Mr and Mrs, I promise. But, um, Do you want us to hold hands? Well, <laughs> <laughs> You two met through rugby? We did. <laughs> okay, we'll move on. You can tell it. I uh, will I tell it? Um, I promised I wouldn't embarrass him, though. He'd never do this sort of stuff again. Okay. But brief, brief summary. Brief we met summary. at Shannon Rugby Club, where we both were playing at the time. The Foley's sort of introduced us. Anthony shoved him over. Rosie shoved me over. Andrew said hello. Actually, Brendan had a lot to do with it as well. And um, yeah, so that was back in 2001. Right. And should look, we haven't looked back since. Great. Anything to add, John? Well, this is the foot and mouth. It was the break for the foot and mouth, so I was, I was around for a few weekends. Yeah. He had nothing else to do, actually. I went to the cinema with um, a group of my Shannon clubmates. You know, I was, had nothing else to do either because of the, the foot and mouth, apart from yeah. work full time. But, uh, and then there was him and Stringer and Golov and a couple of other. They were in camp in Castle Troy. And um, we were like, totally, totally unplanned. And um, Aquini was with you as well, wasn't he, at the time? And uh, so the girls were like, geez, there he is. We hadn't started going out at this stage. And um, I was like, all right, yeah, yeah, cool. So anyway, the rest, of, we went in to watch. What was it? That, we're going to show our age yeah, now. I don't even remember. Yeah, so Brendan met Trudy, I think, yeah. So me and my friends <laughs> went in, like that, and then the rest of the boys went in, right. and no sign of John. And I thought, holy, I can't say S-H-I-T. You the can, holy, say what you want. Yeah, holy God, he's gone now, that's totally, that's ruined it. Anyway, about five minutes later, he comes in, and the boys wouldn't let him in. Quinny blocked him from getting into the seats. <laughs> so 
so he had to go and sit in his own or sit with me, but he sat in his own on that night. <laughs> you did, did you? I think so. No. No. Just in front of them, yeah. Right. Sometimes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, God bless the foot and mouth anyway, John. Yeah. <laughs> He's loud as a silver light. <laughs> <laughs> That's the nicest thing uh. you've ever said. <laughs> <laughs> the wedding speech was one minute. Well, I, 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 that doesn't shock us. Yeah. Uh, but, a, but a great one minute. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, Brof, you turned up here at 18, 19 years of age, John. You were vaguely in the area and you hadn't played rugby at all. What took you so long? Uh, I suppose I didn't come from a rugby family, I suppose, but one thing. Captain Moore wouldn't have uh, a massive history of rugby. There was a few fellas from there who played. Um, John O'Dea was obviously playing there at the time as well. And another John Hayes, who owns the pub in Captain Moore, had played here as well. He's from just over the road. Um, I was just had left school the year before and was looking for a um, new challenge, I suppose, and had been watching it on television and decided to give it a go. And Jack was coming over one and just came on with him just for to literally to see how it would go and just very first train session knew that this is the game I wanted to play. Because you'd been GEA before that? All GEA, Harland and football, growing up in school and club as well. Like, so, yeah. And did you love the GEA or was it indifferent? Um, I love playing it and stuff like that, but training and stuff like that, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been... Uh, regular at those sessions, you know, and I'm sure some of the GA lads, uh, the courses that would have been fed up with trying to get me to go train and stuff like that. But as soon as I turned up here, it was just the opposite. It was just a good way to train every day. I can I can impose physical harm on people and get away with it. Uh, no, I wouldn't have been as much at that stage. Uh, I was longer and skinnier, well, the same length, but it was a lot skinnier at that stage. So I uh, wasn't throwing anything around at that stage, just getting bossed around, I'd say. And, Getting minded there by Joe Malone, I see him down there, uh, yeah. my second row partner for my first year or two. But we might go down to uh, Joe Malone in just a second if we're getting Mike uh, over to Jer. Fiona, you, I mean, you went over, you were doing physiotherapy over in the northeast of England and you p played camogie, I think, for Tipperary until yeah. leaving cert. So, but for the fact that there was no camogie over in the northeast of England, you're not going to three World Cups and winning 60 caps for Ireland. No, no, that's it. Yeah, I started playing with Novocastrians, which is in, in Newcastle. Um, loved it uh, just after when I finished my, my studies and um, played for the Irish Exiles then. That was the, the route forward and then came over and I think I had one training session and um, then got selected, you know, to, to play for Ireland or whatever. So it was a different thing then. So that was 94 mm. and um, yeah, three World Cup later. Uh, yeah, because <laughs> you made your debut in, I think, the second ever women's test match for Ireland, yeah. which was in Raven Hill. So That's 94, it. I mean, the game has come on yeah, it has. so much so quickly. But yeah. the landscape in 94, I mean, you're, the second ever test match yeah. that Ireland have ever played you're a part of. Oh, sure, look, it was, people thought I was odd and mad and everything else. And I remember being home sort of, um, you know, at the Christmas time and stuff and saying to my parents, oh, I was going to try out to play for Ireland. In what? Like, do you know, well, in rugby. Like, we would have always watched the Six Nations or the Five Nations as it was at the time. Mm. Um, that was always a ritual, but we would have been GA as well. Like, my dad's from Galway, so he's... Um, and I'm very much a Tipperary person, and I know we lost at the weekend, so I'm a bit... Yeah, OK. <laughs> did, but, you, uh, did you watch that match together? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But you know what? He's holding his powder dry until August because I still think we're going to make a great comeback. And it's a long summer ahead, like. Okay. Yeah. So um, anyway, that's a brief. Yeah. And did you, did, did you pretty quickly win the parents around? Yeah. No, in fairness, they've, like, both our parents have always been supportive. Like, John's parents have travelled all over, like, Europe. His mother, anywhere you'd ask her to go, you know, she'd, she'd go with you. And my parents were the same. Like, they didn't come to Raven Hill for the first time, but anything that was in, in Dublin, you know, we played in Black Rock and played in Old Crescent as well and stuff. And they'd be in, and, like, my dad, you know, I was the only girl playing under 14 hurling um, when I was under 14. And, he tied a, a pink ribbon on my helmet so that the boys would know they were being beaten by a girl. Do you know what I mean? So they were always really supportive of me, yeah, yeah. And, and still are. And we had a, a rugby festival for girls here a few weeks ago and I had five nieces playing underage. Right. So, like, for me, that's just, that's amazing, do you know? Yeah, because I know, I think there's 16 teams I was hearing here, here at Bruff, but you're very involved with the underage setup and trying to get young girls involved. Yeah, 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 I do that. So I, I help coach the under nines. Pat is down there in the, in the audience. He uh, keeps us all on track, so myself and Mickey Cahill and Dan, we have the under nine boys. We have about 30 to 37 um, young lads and four girls in that. So right. I enjoy coaching the boys just as much and it's just my way of, okay, well, we'll bring a few girls along and try and grow them. And there's a couple train with the under 10s with, with, with Tony and the boys as well, which is great. And then we had an under 10s girls team just uh, the first time at, at the end of the season, which is which is fantastic, and I think that's the way that it's my way. It's not everybody's way, but if the girls are allowed to play with them up to 11, 12, then I think their skill set will be fantastic. Mm. And um, 
they'll certainly learn it the right way with us anyway. Yeah, I'm sure they will. Yeah, if we go down to Ger Malone, Ger was a former player here and president here from 05 to 07, I think, Ger, and Great. you're the, the incoming Munster Rugby Branch president as well, so congratulations. You, you played a bit with John Hayes here? Oh, I played a very small bit with John. Um, he's a bit like he is now, quiet, gentle, but uh, very determined, and uh, obviously massive change for John from 92 to playing with me to getting his first cap in 2000 over against Scotland, so well done, John. When um, he turns up as an 18, 19 year old, is, and he, I mean, he said he really enjoyed his first training session. Yes. Is the potential obvious? I know he was a second row initially. Yes, correct. And was the potential obvious? Or no, you couldn't, you couldn't nobody have dreamt? Saw nobody <laughs> saw it. <laughs> it's a miracle. We, we never thought he'd be a prop. He fancied himself as number eight. So obviously he, he excelled at prop and he was a fantastic prop. And he brought a new dimension to propping, a new uh, shape of a prop. So obviously he's very successful at what he did. But I think John fancied himself as number eight. Originally. I got a few games at num a few games at number eight. Right. Well, <laughs> Were you just, quicker just, then, like? Just a few games. That was it. Just got to figure it out fairly quick. Not to, <laughs> <laughs> forward was the way from second one, not backward. Uh, the interesting thing in your career, in your early career, that people often mention is your time in New Zealand. Yeah. So I know a player here, a Kiwi here, linked you up with people in New Zealand, and you went over. I think as much to just do a bit of travel as anything. It wasn't like you were setting out on this determined career, and, and going to New Zealand was part of some journey to being a professional rugby player. It was just a marriage of the two, really. Yeah, absolutely, because professionalism, professionalism wasn't even really being spoken about mm. at that stage. That was back, um, I went in just early 95, and it did happen later on that year, professionalism did, but that was absolutely no concern of mine at that stage. Yeah. But yeah, Kynan was playing there, Kynan McGregor, and he'd been here for a couple of years at that stage, and uh, he was heading back out to Invercargill. And um, I had a travel in Bogus, what a lot of young fellas would have at that age, 21, just wanted to travel. Yeah. And he was going, so I had a contact and just to get to play rugby as well. So I had ideas of going to Australia because I don't because living there. But then between the rugby and knowing kind, and I had a contact out there, so I ended up in New Zealand. I read a great piece by Murray Kinsella in the 42, I don't know if you've seen it, about your time out there. He was out there talking to people <laughs> at the club. <laughs> You're so this is going. <laughs> well, you tell me where it's going. I, there was nothing bad in the piece. Do you want, okay, to, you. <laughs> Do you want to confess anything? <laughs> Not unless I have to. No. Uh, but you went at 21. I think you'd never been in a plane before. No. And you go out there 15 and a half stone. You come home 17 and a half stone. A bit more even, yeah. Right, okay. Uh, and that's where you learn your trade. That's where they turn, they, they have a look at you, and I think lifting had come in at that stage in the yeah. line-out, and they said, this guy could be a prop. Yeah, well, yeah, the game changed that year. I was out of, um, then 95, 96, uh, lifting came in, and I had started bulking up this. It was just a natural thing, I think, at age um, from playing. I was starting to put on weight from what I was when I started, and it was just becoming obvious that maybe I was going to be more of a front five player, not in the back row, and then as I bulking up in the front row was the more obvious way to go, so mm. it all just kind of fell into place. How you go from, say, 97, 98, playing, back here playing club rugby, to making your debut for Ireland in 2000 at the age of 26, that's unbelievable. Why, like, do you come back from New Zealand with ambitions to play rugby? Is it a complete shock when Warren Gatlin gets on the phone to you? It was actually, yeah, because I came back... Um, Rough for obviously junior at that stage, and I I played a bit with Shannon before I left. Not much. I'd been dual status with him, so I came back then. I joined Shannon, and there was a good Shannon team going at that stage, winning the AIL. Like so, basically the first thing I came back was to try and get in that team. That was actually a, a challenge enough at that stage. I was still switching over between tight head and uh, second row. Cause I, the first year I was back, I actually played both, and um, so this, the year after that, then Monster kind of it was professional at that stage. Got a um, a contract, just a part-time one for, yeah. for a few months to train again. So, but I was still playing uh, front row, second row, and then at the end of that year, then Shannon, we won the AIL again and got the call to go to South Africa. It's actually 20 years ago, exactly now in '98, and found it on the old-fashioned way on the Airtel, like and just read my name there. <laughs> Didn't believe it at the start. It was actually rang Axel Foley actually at the time to know it was it true and. He had heard from some other way that it was that I was on it. I just I'd never been in any kind of a squad or anything at that stage, and straight in on the senior squad to go to, um, to go to South Africa. Wow! Had you even spoken to Warren Gatland before you saw it on Airtel? No, I just saw it. On, I was. <laughs> he didn't I, speak to him since either. <laughs> 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 I was in a lift with them once. Okay, one up in Delgany, wasn't it? That nice hotel up there, and um, uh, John and I get in. Warren's in, and uh, well. 
that was it. I don't think that he's I'm ever. Not wrong, I've read it. It was just the way it was. <laughs> it's just, yeah. Two quiet men. Right, okay. But you got on okay? Absolutely, yeah, fine, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> Great friends. But no, it was, it was so much experience to go on that tour, like. Sure, um, yeah. I was still actually working all the time at that stage, um, right. right up till the week before the tour, because I was only part time. So that was the start of going on a, on a, a professional tour. So it was some experience to head off. Wow, amazing! Surreal when you say to your parents, "It says here in Airtel, I'm going playing for Ireland." Yeah, like <laughs> absolutely, because I would have looked at it to see did, did Axel make it or Gollum make it or whoever was making it. I just didn't think of my own name. Was <laughs> there. Like, literally, did like, that's honestly true, like, and uh, because it was picked. Again, it goes back to something else. I was picked on club form, not anything representative. Monster, right, OK. Um, we had a few people make the Gordon Darcy talked about it before, and Brian O'Driscoll told us before about your nerves pre-game. Yeah. <laughs> so I remember Darcy talking about it, saying, you know, it was like a time-honored tradition. You'd come into the toilet before you'd be heading out, and you'd see the, two, the bottom of the two boots underneath the cubicle, and hear you retching into the... Yeah. Uh, toilet plenty of times. So you suffered with nerves. Yeah, I do actually. Yeah, and even Sally, she's uh, she's only 11. Oh, she's nearly 12. Even go play come over. She was there the other evening. She's there. I can't eat my dinner. I'm nervous. Like go play. And I was there. Like I can't say anything to her. Like, I couldn't give out to her until it's not so okay. Like because she's obviously I know exactly what she was like. That she was getting nervous for going playing a match. Like and after a while, then when, they, when I had it for so long, then I actually wanted them for a finish because if there was a game where I didn't have it, I was beginning to think, I'm not tuned in right here, like, you know, so yeah. it just becomes part of it. Yeah, I'm sure. But it does away with all the hydration and stuff like that. <laughs> I, could, I give it the whole morning getting hydrated for a match and then all ought to be gone, think, you know, <laughs> start again. Uh, I will, speaking of losing hydration, I mean, invariably the anthem was going to come up for England in 2007. You beside Bob, the tears streaming down your face. Nothing to be embarrassed about. It's, like an, it's an amazing moment, powerful moment. It clearly meant a huge amount to you that week because it wasn't like you cried before every game uh, that we know of. So um, why that game? I know the obvious. It was England and it was Crow Park and it was everything. But had it been a difficult build-up or did it just suddenly hit you in the moment? Or do you know where it came from? Yeah, no, it, was, it was the crowd. Like, you know, the, you hear about people like you could feel the atmosphere. You could actually feel the atmosphere that day. You knew it like... Um, the whole, it was two weeks leading into the game and you just knew that it was the whole country was talking about it from different points of view. Some people thought it was great we were playing there and other people were entitled to their opinion that maybe we shouldn't have been allowed in there to play there. Real GA people might have felt we shouldn't have been allowed. So it was and you felt that responsibility that you knew um, there was going to be a big occasion and just to be part of it. And does any part of you think, geez, I'm crying here? I don't think so at the time. No, I don't remember back in it. Um, no, I just... It, you probably did maybe know it was coming, but you couldn't stop it. Like so, it just happens. Like and it's just you could feel it out of the crowd. Like it wasn't just me. That I guarantee you, if the crowd cameras were looking the other way in the crowd, there was a lot of fellas in the crowd doing the same as well. Like because the atmosphere was unbelievable. Yeah. Where were you that day, Fiona? Yeah, I was there, um, yeah. crying. Yeah. But um, like well, it's not the only time, I suppose. You know that John would have that would have been his biggest emotional sort of moments ever. <laughs> you know, in terms of like I knew what he would go through, I suppose, and I knew the, what you would feel playing for your country and everything. So, mm. um, yeah, no, I was lucky to be at that one. I, while I was playing and he was playing, I didn't always get to, to be at his internationals. So, mm. um, it, it, yeah, and it was, it was a big, big occasion. So. Did you suffer with nerves? Um, yeah, I never was sick, though. Um, but, yeah, in a, probably in a different way. But, mm. um, yeah, I just, it's... And I suppose I, I would have cried during, you know, singing... Um, are on Levine for, for Ireland as well, and for loads of reasons, but a lot of them being you're playing for your country and, and the, the fight and the struggle and everything that we had to go through to, to get there in terms of pure logistics and mm. the cost of it and how much you'd given up to do it. Um, but also the fact that you're playing for your country and you can't underestimate it. And even still, like when the internationals are on, like it's, it's huge. And like when I suppose Sally and Roisin got to come to they saw the last one in, in Croke Park, didn't they? I think yeah. it, in, um, it was 2010. 2010 yeah. And like, but like Sally at that stage could sing Ireland's Call. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, and you know, even still you sort of feel that. Because once, once you've played like for your country, represented, it's, it's huge. And I think you, you, it'll always be emotional. And if, if it's not emotional for you, what are you doing like? Mm. Do you know? Yeah. So certainly coming through Brough and playing for Ireland were all huge. And then Munster, of course, is such a big part of your career. 217 appearances, two Heineken Cups, an amazing time and an amazing team. We did a roadshow at the Mansion House about a month ago. I don't know where you're listening. 
No, okay. <laughs> it's no problem. I'll be, I'll be honest. <laughs> <laughs> we had Alan Quinlan and Marcus Horan there. Oh, right. Yeah, and then... Um, <laughs> uh, it, it was a contentious night, to say the least. It seems there's been a 10-year saga going on, and... Oh, yes. We're going to play people a little clip here, just if you hadn't heard it. So, it seems like this was a big deal. We didn't know this was that, that big a deal until uh, Quinny and Marcus Horan brought it up. So, uh, as you'll hear, effectively, there's a, there's a fight and training, and it involves Quinny and a few other people, and someone gets involved, as you'll hear, and, and hits Quinny from behind. And it seems a person on the team, to be known as Mr. X, inserts himself into the whole thing and causes a serious issue between uh, Marcus Horne and Alan Quinlan. So we'll play you a clip now. It's a couple of minutes, two, three minutes, but it's actually worth it. So here's Alan Quinlan explaining all. There was a bit of a tr an argument at training. It got fairly heated. I was involved in a scuffle with someone which is totally unlike me. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, I, I felt a couple of punches, so I was on the ground scuffling with someone, I think. It was in a line-out, and I felt a couple of punches kind of graze the back of my head. And I remember getting up thinking, who was that? I, I just want to find out who that was. And uh, I got a little nudge off someone, Mr. X, we can't name him but to this day. And he said, that was Marcus. He came in with a few sneaky digs there, and it was nothing to do with him. So I said, right. And I was steaming after that then. I was like... I'm going to start this for loud. I had no issue with whoever I was fighting with on the ground. I think it was <laughs> Trevor Hogan and Stephen Kyo, and the team was picked, and the boys were getting stuck into the training. So I didn't really have any issue with them after that. But it was Marcus, and we ran down. We were doing more line-outs, and I kept saying it to him... It wasn't Marcus. Uh, that's the point. No. <laughs> you stay out of this now. Um, so I, I ran after him, the and I kept, I kept, getting kept, legs, I like kept telling him, Marcus, I'm, you're go I'm going to get you for that. And Hang on now, Marcus, I'll meet you in the car, this, this was so school boy, I'm yeah. going to meet you in the car park after training. Yeah, let me finish the story. <laughs> <laughs> we... So, I, uh, I was chatting to him at Did the back of the line. Did you not say that? Shh, be quiet, you'll get your turn to reply in a minute. So I was at the back of the line and I, was, uh, <laughs> I kept saying to him, I am going to, I'm going to meet you after training, so I'm going to meet you after training. And it was a bit childish, but I was... I was fuming. So anyway, after training, anyway, Marcus walks out, and I walked out after him, and I, I, I challenged him over this incident. And I remember Frankie Sheehan ended up being kind of in the middle of us and separating us, and, and I kept saying, Marcus, well, I was told by Mr. X that you tried to hit me, and he was denying it. I never tried to do that. That wasn't me. And then Frankie was like, look, and you kept saying to me then, who, who, is the, who told you? And I said, I'm not telling you. And then Frankie said, right, for the sake of the argument, we'll call him Mr. X. <laughs> so Frankie was debating away this argument and, and referring to Mr. X. So uh, Marcus still doesn't know who Mr. X is to this day. We ended up shaking hands and leaving it at that, but Mr. Mr. X, X is, is a lawyer, right? Mr. X is... Uh, <laughs> Mr. X still hasn't been revealed. He's probably listening tonight, actually. I wasn't in an ass's roar to fight. That's the hilarious well, thing about it. That's the information. We had a, we had a fight before I that. I trusted Mr. X. He, to, he gave me that information, and oh, it, was, it was correct. That's twice now in five minutes you're pleading innocent. Absolutely. I'm totally on the, the wrong end of these stories, I have to say. Do you know who Mr. X is, Liam? I do. You know, most I of won't the, be revealing most them, of the rest of the squad know who Mr. X is. Yeah. Do, you not think, Everyone knows. do you not think on live radio in front of this crowd that you should reveal, finally, who Mr. X is? I is have a tight? feeling myself, there is, is no tight? Mr. X. Your man got it wrong. No. Okay. And I'm it's pure embarrassed. I'm going to reveal, we have a WhatsApp group that um, often the question comes up, who is Mr. X in the WhatsApp group? The, the, Mr. X is... Are we a drum roll, no? The one and only oh, John the Bull Hayes. No. <laughs> I actually suspect it's out. Twelve years later, uh, John Hayes is Mr. X. Geez. What's your initial reaction, Marcus? I'm disgusted. disgusted. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely disgusted. I I say, did I travel home? No, I travelled home with Wally that day. I was actually the story is I was in the car driving. Your man comes to the window. Yeah, step Man, out. out. It was, it was a bit... <laughs> yeah. I said, what age you? It was a bit old school stuff, you know, and it had to be sorted so out. So I, I went to get out of the car, and Wally goes, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> it's Mr. X, everyone, John Hayes. Oh. oh. Controversial. Do you want to apologise to Marcus Horn? No, oh, this is true. <laughs> <laughs> Marcus Horn says he was nowhere near that fight. Absolutely. It's a pity there wasn't cameras at that training session <laughs> to solve all those issues. I think Alan Quinlan got in trouble for revealing who Mr. X was. Did he? Yeah. 
he's well used to it anyway. That's true. <laughs> uh, that kind of captures the beautiful madness of that group. Yeah, see, it was when something grows legs and then you just couldn't stop it, so I just had to let it go and I tested. If I'd been asked today what, I'd have said it, but it just became such a thing that it just became brilliant. It's actually a pity that they've let it out because, well, it's not, I suppose, but <laughs> to let it go for a few more years was brilliant. Because every time we'd meet up, it would always come up like it, it was. It was great, Craig. Uh, there was an amazing bond with that team. They're a kind of special group of men to achieve what they achieve. You must have loved it. It must have been great fun to go into that atmosphere every day, both the fun and working towards winning two European Cups. Yeah, it was, it was great. It was a great journey. Like, you know, it started off um, back in the late 90s, you know, in early, early days of professionalism. And when you look at what's professional now, what we were doing then as professionals, it was just nowhere near what it was, but we thought it was. And just hmm. every year, it just got more and more. And um, there were some great players involved, good, strong characters, like Gollum and Claw were still around at that stage. And they had great um, experience from Europe, and they had played in, in big games. And then we just eventually got going, and then we won one. And then you realize if you win one, you can win another one. And just got going, this, um, mm. not just playing at home, but learning how to win on the road was probably one of the biggest things. Were you a big speaker in that environment? or? Uh, no, no. <laughs> there, was, there was plenty of fellas in there yeah. for that, like, so no, it wouldn't have been. And in your own way, I guess a question for both of you and your rugby careers, you first, John, were you obsessive in a quiet way? Like, you know the way we think of people like O'Connell and O'Gara, real obsessives, thinking about it all the time, unbelievably driven. It seems like a stupid question to ask someone who's achieved what you have, because you must have worked very hard, but would you have classed yourself as obsessive in the way that others were, or were you more laid back? Oh, I would have been. I, I think everybody is. You want you won't get anywhere near that level if you're not. There will always be leaders in the group, people who are more vocal than other fellas, but everybody in any group, because if you're not, the group won't be successful. So everybody was um, individually for themselves trying to improve and just as a, as a group to get the team better. And so for you, did that, was, did that mean diet? Did that mean work in the gym? Were you thinking about it all the time? Yeah, it, it was, like I said, it was all the early stages of professionalism. Yeah. The diet was changing, it was becoming more and more uh, our fitness levels were going up. Again, what we thought was fit in 97, 98 wasn't fit a couple of years later because the standards were just going up all the time. Mm. Video analysis came in, looking at your game, how to improve all the time. So it was just every year. With, and at that age, when you're involved in that, it's just such a great opportunity. You just take it with both hands. Yeah. Fiona, I guess you're trying to even, I mean, you talked there about how difficult it was logistically mm. just to get on the pitch and, and keep this show on the road. So I guess you're obsessive in your own way and then trying to manage a working life outside of rugby. Yeah, I suppose it was different. I mean, the, I moved back to Ireland um, at the end of 2000 because I had spent 11 out of 16 weekends over in Ireland, you know, the, the season that I just finished and we weren't in the Six Nations at the time. So like you have to be obsessive and you have to like your whole life revolves around it. But and even to the today, like the, the girls that are playing and have careers as well, it is an absolute obsession and you can mm. only do that for, for so long and then you have to look at, you know, the rest of your, of your life or whatever. So, yeah, you, you definitely have to be. And I suppose I was lucky in England at the time. We had some really good coaches up in Newcastle and, um, you know, I had uh, one of my friends, Ruth McEwen, she was from the north, but she was playing for Ireland as well. And we just, we got ourselves a personal trainer. We, you know, got gym memberships, sort of, you know, someone who knows somebody. Do you know the way rugby mm. clubs are, are great for that sort of stuff? And I actually went back to university in, um, in Northumbria for that final year. They just, they wanted me to play for them. And then they'd give me the same status as their, you know, their Newcastle Falcons um, Academy boys. And so they paid for all my trips home that year. I did a diploma in information technology, just in case you want to know my qualifi extra qualification <laughs> that I got that year. But it was great. And we got to play in the booth. I got, you know, all of that sort of stuff. So, but those are the things that you do regardless. Yeah. Um, but just another point to John's sort of obsession or how, I suppose, streamlined he was. So he never rang me or spoke to me on the morning of an international. So if... If my international was on the, the Friday and he was playing at the side, he thought it was fine to ring me up and like talk to me before my match, but there was no communication the other way before his match. But like I totally respected that yes. as well, and it, it was nice. Like I didn't mind speaking to him beforehand as long as it was far enough away from it. But we never spoke, so we didn't done the the day of an international release. It was no, you would. It was just the way it was. We've always been trying to just keep focused on the day. Yeah. yeah. Um, can I ask you about so the Grand Slam in '09? What a huge career highlight for you that is as well. Uh, there's somebody wondering, I mean, I'm sure you get asked this all the time, why did you, can, we, can you ask the bull why you buggered off for the Grand Slam homecoming in 09, says uh, Colm and Grange. Oh yeah, that was because we just said our new baby Roshan was only born two weeks before that, so. Okay. 
Um, I'd seen her once, I think once for a day or something, yeah. so just wanted to come back for that. And I wasn't drinking. I used to drink earlier on in my career, but it wasn't at that stage. And the boys were in some state, like so it was actually a pleasure <laughs> just, to just get away from them. Like, okay. just, don't, just don't even want the plane journey home from Wales was, was long enough. Like, so. <laughs> <laughs> but they think it's funny when you haven't had sleep and you've been drinking all night, and when you've when you've had a good sleep and a breakfast and near it, it's just not the same. You're just not at the same wavelengths. You're just easy to get out of there. So you got up and got out of there. I think you watched the homecoming on TV. Yeah, didn't I was you? actually home before they were at the mansion house. Or whatever. I actually got home. So. And poor Tommy Bow having to sing. And yeah, but sure, I don't think he, he actually hadn't slept like, so that's how you can imagine how bad he was. Like. <laughs> uh, that was the famous year of the Enfield meeting where Leinster and Munster had this thing. Rob Carney supposedly stood up and yeah. maybe asked a question of the uh, Munster yeah. lads. Um, What's your memory of that, as a Munster man? Yeah, like, in some ways, su surprised, like, because like, there was no way I could have ever have thought that anyone would think that, again, you can speak for yourself first, that I would have thought that anyone would thought that I played less, with less passion or cared less about playing for Ireland, like, than, than for, for Munster. Like, there's just no way, like, it's, you're representing your province, then you're representing your country, but maybe he just felt at the time that it was a fair question, and if, if he was thinking it, or any of the Leinster boys younger, he was on a young for that stage, any of the younger Leinster lads or the other Leinster lads were looking at us thinking that maybe we did care a bit more than that, that it was great that he got it out there because it certainly wasn't true and there has never been any issue with it since. But if it was something that he felt it was fair balls of him to ask it and mm. say it, and it definitely cleared the air, if from their point, if there was an issue, because I don't think any of the Munster lads that I knew or ever played with ever ever felt that. Yeah. And how did you enjoy your time? So obviously the Munster crew all from down here and had a great bond. How did you like mixing with the Leinster lads up in Ireland? I saw an article by Dennis Hickey where he was just talking about how well you two got on, but it was kind of a, you know, you, you, every time he says you'd see him, you'd say, oh, here's Fancy Dan Hickey. Yeah. And you'd be like, what colour boots are you wearing today? That's because he what's used your, to get... What's, what's your favourite type of latte? All this kind of stuff to uh, he used Dennis to get Hickey. Call, he used to get called that. He actually came up with the Fancy Dan because he used to get called that when he played in Limerick for St. Mary's or whatever, okay. that's it. Someone, in the crowds would be shouting, Hickey, you fancy then, go back to Dublin. <laughs> so it was probably worse on it as well, but he didn't mention that, but so that's where that came from. But and, and did you get on with that new breed, like so Rob Carney coming through, the likes of Jamie Heasler, people like that? Did yeah, you get on? Myself and Jamie used to sit in the same seat on the bus always, like, you know, so. We were I wouldn't put you two together. Quite childish, but we used to call it the JH seat, like, you know. <laughs> When I retired then, I had J.H. as my initials, and he had J.H.E. because he couldn't have J.H. Like, and I kind of had seniority on J.H. Uh, <laughs> initials on your gear, but when I retired then, I gave it to him. Like, so and what, what would you good crack in the bus, because for a finish, he was always out with the phone. Yeah. Twin, I was just looking at him, but that, but that was the way it was. Because I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't, have thought, I wouldn't have thought you and Heathcliff would have much in common. That's no, and that would have been another thing when you're asking about the, the nerves on the day of the games. So if I remember... We'd moved in, we'd be staying in the Shelburne, like, mm. and, you know, you wake up in the morning, yeah, you'd be nervous and stuff like that. Even in 09, was kind of some of those young fellas first year, and we'd met up to do the lineouts, whatever, in the morning, the game, about 11 o'clock. It was Luke Fitz and he said, would come in, have him up in graphics or something with a, a coffee to go from someplace, like, kind of, how were they out around the street, just Relax. strolling, like, where I'd have been inside in the room, tying myself in knots, like, about, <laughs> and if I was to look back on it now, it probably would be one thing that I would love to change, it would have been to be a little bit more relaxed, like, then, because, they didn't went out that evening and played out of their skins. Like, mm. so. Almost. It would have been interesting as an experiment to go with them, get a coffee. To so try it, yeah. Maybe talk to your wife on the phone for a few yeah, minutes, yeah. you know? <laughs> Who knows? Try, try the coffee first. <laughs> <laughs> try to start, try start drinking coffee first. Ah, uh, dear. You're a monster. You're a terrible man. Yeah. <laughs> but no, that's, that was the great thing about it was, and that's how you, you get success was the likes of those young fellas <clears> coming in. They brought in that new... Just no baggage, no hassle, mm. no just go out and play and just did it. Yeah, uh, amazing, really. Um, I want to get another word on Brough, if we can. So uh, Peter Malone is in the crowd as well, Jer's son. So you would have played with the club as well. Peter, I know you're, you were working with the under-20s last year and you're responsible for bringing players through for Munster. Mm -hmm. So developing those elite players. Yeah. If I was to, and you, you, can put me, you can correct me where I'm wrong here, you know, you look at the Leinster system at the moment and it seems like they've all, in particular the brilliant private schools, probably having lads coaching a few times a week. They're all over the, the place and then the Leinster Academy can cherry pick the best ones and it dovetails beautifully and they're funneling through. I mean, the amount of talent coming through is insane. Mm. How does Munster compare with Leinster when you're trying to develop players to go into that Munster first team? Yeah, well, we're different and there's different systems. Uh, well, different feeding systems, I think, really. Like all the academies, the Irish academies are 
they're all IRFU academies, they're all funded by IRFU, we're all, we're all checked every year, say, listen, are we following the, the right protocols? But Munster's a different culture, so we have a, a good school system, but it's different to Leinster, there isn't the same quantity of players, I'd say, and we probably have a more of a connection with our clubs as well, and you're trying to marry the two of them and try and bring the best out of your club system, and also try and support your schools a bit more and pick the best out of that school system whilst probably realising that we're never going to have the same volume of players mm. coming through as Leinster, but it's trying to pick the best of them and work with those. Like, you know, in, in an average age grade year, you might have 15 Leinster guys in a 30-man squad. If, if you have nine or 10 Munster guys, that's great. We've got to work with those guys to pick the best of them and, and try and get that level. And at the moment, um, Leinster are, are European champions and possible Pro 14 champions. And we're every year striving to, to catch them, and yeah. that's where we are. I don't think, you know, we're in Munster, we're looking to, that's our bar, we're looking to win European Cups and be the top table in Europe every year. We've been semi-finalists for the last two years, and, you know, no one wants to be just a semi-finalist, mm. but we're, we're striving to, to reach that bar every year, and that's the goal, and we start out every year. And where does a club like Brough fit into trying to find another John Hayes, or is, is that really what Brough is about? I don't think that's what Brough is about, and, and lads can correct me here if I'm wrong. Part of it's about that, so if a player progresses well enough here and, and reaches a certain level, there should be an opportunity for a player from Brough to come through to the highest level of rugby. Mm. Um, but, but Brough is also about playing the game, putting, putting teams in the field, competing every week from under eights to, to senior rugby and, and now ladies rugby as well, you know. So I think that's what Brough is about. And as part of that, there might be some player under 16 or 17 or under 18 who, who Munster see and say, right, here's another John Hayes. Let's have a look at him and support him to try and get him through the next level. And, and Brough can be both a club where competing at all levels at, at national rugby and underage rugby and women's rugby and also producing hopefully a future professional and a future international. Yeah. Fiona, I, I get the impression you see it as very much a community thing, first and foremost. And oh, yeah. total bonus if you produce someone, but that's not what this is, it's about for you. Yeah, and I, I mean, I got it. I suppose I'm a bit <coughs> embarrassed. I'm only here sort of maybe two seasons since I yeah. started helping out with the, with the underage or whatever. but. It's just fantastic. You come here on a Sunday morning and like there's, I don't know, is there a hundred kids running around? You know, it's just, it's fantastic. And all the volunteers and the, and the coaches that do that. And I think you can instill in, in boys and girls at a really young age, the discipline that you get from rugby is transferable to life. Mm. And I think that's really, really important. And Brough has certainly welcomed me here, you know, with, with open arms, um, which, has been, which has been fantastic. And um, yeah, it, it's huge. I think... For me, getting kids to play sports is the most important thing. I mean, we both came from a GA background. Um, our two girls played GA and then they still play GA. And last year, they both looked to play rugby. So Brough was the, the automatic choice, but we waited till they wanted to yeah. ask. And they came and then we have a yoke at home that we might bring here sometime when he's, you know, <laughs> socially acceptable. <laughs> yeah, 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 civilized. That's the, or maybe a little uncivilized would be good too, but uh, yeah. How old is he? Nearly six. Okay, yeah, so yeah, a few see, years yet. Well, we'll see. see. It was quite funny. I'll tell a, a story, but uh, cause he, I come with the girls on a Sunday morning and, and help out Sally's with Heidi with the under 12s, 13s, and then Roshin's with me with the, the under 9 boys. And uh, why do you always take the girls to rugby and leave me at home with him? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and um, I was like, well, do you know, because Mammy's coaching, so I can't look after you. And he said, like, but next year maybe you can come and play. He's going to kill me for this when he's older. But um, he goes, I'm not going to play the rugby. I might fall on the grass and it might be prickly. <laughs> <laughs> so don't hold out any hope, lads, for John Hayes' son, OK? You've got a better chance with his daughters. <laughs> that they might, been, uh, yeah. He's been toughened up since I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now John is like, you know those friends that have those boys that are four years older than Bill? Can you bring them round? So, um, yeah. We, we had a, a Holy Communion on, on Saturday. It was Roisin's Holy Communion. So I think we had... 10 plus boys that were all older than Bill. Okay, so the, the on a bounce castle and playing rugby in the garden. So, okay. the, you know, it's the process of toughening them up has begun. Yeah, well so that the grass isn't too prickly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and did you ever find the grass prickly, John, or were you generally <laughs> okay? You're right. But funny, like the, the Clinetti lads are all given out about the prickly grass up in Scotstone, aren't they? I so, do you know? I, like think, he, I think that's fair enough. Yeah. Uh, the 4G pitches would absolutely destroy you. You, yeah. you. you can't be a fan of them. Yeah, like they can be, like, you know. I suppose fellas just have to put on a bit of some sort of vesin or something in your knees, like, you know, because it's going to happen. There's going to be more and more of them, like, but yeah. they definitely make for better surface for playing on. Uh, do you miss the rugby much now, John? Um, 
sometimes it's like you know when you see some of the big games even when Munster were playing around you'd miss some of those big games you'd love to be involved in those but a lot of the other games now in pre-season training and the travel that they're going through don't miss that anymore right okay yeah, no, definitely not. and life now it seems like obviously family is is very important to you you're on the farm that you grew yeah. up on so yeah. you've 90 acres i think i was reading yeah, i read it in the farmer's journal there's a great pick you there look at this this should be on a calendar somewhere this is absolutely <laughs> unbelievable well, there's like, one coming out for next christmas i'm telling yeah. you <laughs> i can see fiona where you went for the, i mean look at that hunk of beef there yeah. i tell you <laughs> purebred <laughs> um so Farming was always a part of your yeah, upbringing. Now you were saying your parents are still on the farm yeah, with you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, most of fine. Yeah. So tell us about farming. What is it that you love about it? I yeah, presume I love is the word. Yeah. Well, you want to love it after this winter. I tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of fellas fairly sick of it. Um, yeah. You, if you grow up doing it, like you know, it's it's just something that you you um you really want to get involved in and try and make it better. It's something that you just um challenge yourself at again. Like you know, it's a great interest to have. And so what's the nature of your farm? Are you beef, suckler beef. Right. Yeah, so breeding cows and so you're really trying to breed better ones every year. And what's a daily, like what's an average day for you these days? Say kids are going to school or whatever, do you? Yeah, I, I drop them to school in the mornings, like, you know, so. Um, Get and that, lunches, all that stuff. All that done, yeah. Do you? Fairly handy at it as well. Are you? Yeah. Right, in on. fact, if I happen to be off in the morning, he just says, look, just go get yourself ready because I would only interfere with the system. Okay, right. So he has the, the system. You've got it well honed. What's a standard lunch? What are we yeah, making? Done. Um, well, Sally likes pasta at the moment. Roshan is on a wrap and Bill is on a roll, like, you know, so <laughs> you, have, you have to have three different things ready, though. <laughs> okay, well, that is impressive. That's impressive, but that's better than most households. And you have to have yeah. the, the right yogurts and fruit and stuff like that in as well. Like, so, so what type of yogurts? Well, Bill calls his one of Mebby's yogurts because they're the ones that Fiona Actually, the, has. Actually, yeah, the Aldi, zero percent. Oh, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Right. And after that then, he's back home then, and literally up till a fortnight ago, or even, yeah, so it's maybe two weeks ago, was feeding cattle in the shed, like, in the, in the mornings after I'd, come up, after I'd come back from there. Mm. The, the cows were calving during yeah. the springtime as well. Cause, so they're in the shed, with the weather, you couldn't get yeah, them out? Yeah, they, they were literally in until about two weeks ago, I'd say, so yeah. way longer than they should have been. So that makes life more expensive if you have to feed them as opposed to grass in the field? It does, yeah, because you're, you're buying, like, I was lucky enough, I didn't have to buy silage, but you're buying me, like, you have to buy extra nuts because they were calving, like, and they were, you need... They, they won't get enough just out of silage. And do you take your farming more seriously now than when you were playing, or is it, is it still a bit of a hobby, or what's your relationship with it? I suppose you take it more seriously in that you're there the whole time, but um, <coughs> it's definitely, but when you, even when you were there, there was always just shorter days where you had to try and prioritise things that you needed to get done because you only had a day or a half a day, whereas now you've kind of a better idea of what you can do over, again, weather permitting, what you can get done. And then is it kids home, help them with homework, all that kind yep. of stuff then? Yeah, learn that how to... Long division, that was the tricky uh, one. Yeah, maths is still a struggle anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Getting flashbacks from school and when trying to teach, but they teach some of the things different, you know, so. And the, the alphabet isn't A, B, C anymore, like, so, so you have to learn how to, they learn to sound it out first before they name the letters. Right. Sounds like a kind of ideal lifestyle, to be honest. It is, yeah, yeah, it's great, yeah. Beautiful, like, to be with your... Be going mad some evenings. Well, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure, but, like, to have your parents there and have the kids there and be able to work the farm, like, sounds yeah. absolutely Id idyllic. Well, no, they're, yeah, they're living just over the road. Yeah, so, yeah, but I guess to, to have it all there. Yeah. Um, and was farming kind of an escape for you when you played, or was it yeah, all? Yeah, it would have been like there would have been days um, when you are playing, you get your day off in the week, like you know. So it, it is good to go in. Uh, there would be a break in it, like that you would get someplace to go, a bit of a, a distraction or whatever from building up too much and pressure on big weeks. Yeah, I, I don't suppose Jamie Heaslip asked much about the farm, did he? He would. They, they would be asking you questions, like you know. And, Pointed so, out tractors to you and stuff. Yeah, well, that was, all, that was the standard gig on the bus, like, but <laughs> you would get asked, like, from times, like, you know, like, what's the difference between a cow and a bull, like, that? they wouldn't actually, <laughs> that's, that's, that's not actually true, that's, or that's not actually made up, but you would have to describe what, what the difference is between a heifer and all that. The girls and could you, t describe it now for them, yeah, they know in but detail. But the boys, you just realise, fellas that grew up in cities or whatever, they just don't know, like, yeah, well, how, I suppose, how yeah. would they, yeah. yeah? So you'd have to explain it to them. Yeah, taking classes on the bus, like, <laughs> <laughs> what things were like. Oh, dear. Right. Um, listen, we're going to keep you guys out here. We're going to be joined by Eddie O'Sullivan in a few minutes as well, but we're way over time and have to take a break. Um, I think that was brilliant. We give them a round of applause. Fiona and John, everyone. Back in just a second.